true survivor after 16 months away. Here comes a purple rock podcast to brighten up your day. The season will be different with no theme and fewer days. It's good to see the show adapting to our lazy ways. We tell you who the hosts are, but we're running out of time. It's the Purple Rock Survivor Podcast. Welcome to the Purple Rock Survivor Podcast. I am John. My co-host is Andy. And this week we are talking episode five of Survivor season 41. Andy, before we get started, I, I got a little plan I'm going to propose to you here. We need to do an intentional Matt Singh strategy here, Andy. We, we got a we got a big group. We start we have six people in this Purple Rock Podcast staff. I think I'm thinking we got to whittle it down intentionally to just us so that we're less threatening. What do you think? Normally, I am opposed to the intentional Matt Singh, but the logic in this one is air sound, like airtight. I no no notes. Like I'm fully on board. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of chaff in this uh, Purple Rock podcast. So if we could just get it down to us, I think that would be the way to go. Yeah, I would say that it'd be tough to like figure out who to target first because, of course, we can only vote one at a time. But let's be honest, it's not that tough. No, 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 no. And and really, who cares about the order, really? <laughs> You know, we're just going to... The beauty is they all get to just think, who was he talking about? He wasn't talking about me. He was talking about that one. Yep. They definitely all think it's someone else. Uh, So anyway, this episode, however, of television, what'd you think of it? I loved it. Honestly, like, it's a tough call, but I think this one was my favorite so far. See, I disagree with you. I think it was just yet another... You you disagree with how I feel about it? I do. I think you are incorrect in how you feel about how you feel these things. Uh, I think you thought it was in a predictable boot episode, and I just... If only there had been some sort of, you know, advantages or something like that to really spice things up and add some drama to what was an obvious chalk vote, that would have been just amazing. Can you imagine? Oh, wait. Oh, wait! That's fucking exactly what happened we had a boring ass chalk vote and it was only entertaining because of the advantages that we'd heard or seen through the rest of the season imagine that shit andy yeah it's almost like the show had to add adaptations to uh the evolving nature of it in order to continue for like 40 iterations you know I, the american ninja warrior they don't just climb up a wall anymore things have to change in order to adapt to players playing a certain way because yeah i mean uh, we've yet to see an advantage be played but it totally affected this episode i think a lot of the interest was as a result of oh my god is something really going to happen all because of you know advantage stuff so you know, when people reflexively c- complain constantly about these things, maybe keep this in mind or don't. I mean, it's your, 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 your dime. You can be as hypocritical as you'd like. I am often. Yeah. And I will give you a little bit of credit here because you did point out when this uh, advantage complaining happened earlier in the season that, you know, some of these advantages would lead to actual character moments. And I think that's a big part of why this episode was so good. It wasn't that the advantages existed, it was watching the people and how they interacted with each other and with the advantages. And that like made the episode so much better than it would have been with just them discussing the dynamics of the vote. Yeah, in some ways, this is just us doing what we always do, and that's poking the bear. Uh, Generally over a conversation that, frankly, we're undecided about whether, like maybe there are too many, like I think we're on the fence about leaning towards that. But when I genuinely think of this episode... I think everything great about it is related, at least in some way, to the distribution or management or consideration of advantages and idols. I'm not sure there's a single moment that we're going to talk about here that doesn't touch upon it at least a bit. Oh, I mean, I really, I think that the Sydney spearfishing scene was the highlight of the episode. So that's the one. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) There you go. People who wanted to go back to the basics, you got what you wanted. You got... Your favorite player, Sydney, doing what we've rarely ever seen in the history of the show. I, I'm, I'm sure that Twitter was lit up with like, yes, queen, finally, we're breaking down barriers and showing that a woman can be the provider. And you may recall, you know, Edgic, the infallible predictor of winners, once said that when Ken in Millennials vs. Gen X did this exact same thing, spearfished and was featured doing so, he was the odds-on winner, so... 
bad news, everyone. Sydney is apparently winning your season. Or great news, because again, she's a pioneer. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> I had totally forgotten that moment because it's inconsequential. Exactly. But that is probably the only thing that happened this episode that is not, a, at least in part, a result of the tinkering that the show has done that everybody hates so much. Um, you know, I, I thought of this as like a positive about the, the various advantages. And we're going to get into like the, the new one, especially a little later. Um, is that it gives people like certain survivor fans something to fixate on. They don't need to go out and find something to complain about. They can just complain about advantages because there is a significant chunk of the fandom that really truly doesn't know how to engage with the show if they're not complaining. So look, instead of like like hunting deep into these people's social media profiles or like trying to find problems or complaining about the editing, it's like, hey, yeah, you complain about this thing. And then not understanding when they say it's a great cast, they don't need this. It's like, oh, you think it's a great cast? Do you hmm? Does that maybe perhaps suggest that they're not these advantages aren't distracting from that cast as much as you say they are? <laughs> if we know that they're great, it's probably because they've been given enough time. Imagine that they have somehow had the opportunity to shine on the screen. It wasn't that we were just constantly reading advantage text. But we are so are reading. A bunch of, of course, advantage I mean text. we pause the screen and take screenshots of that shit. But other than that. And yeah, Advantage is played in uh, so much throughout the episode that we're basically going to talk about it in chronological order, which we often don't do. I find that actually an uncreative way to uh, structure an episode. But honestly, often if we do go, um, you know, point by point throughout an episode, it's probably because it was a boring episode. Yep. Usually I like to structure it of like, what's our like hot take? But I think in this one, it really works for one, because again, I think it was a fantastic episode beginning through end. Um, so let's start with the kind of the first thing is like, Jeannie, what's she doing? Like, she, what was that? Oh, man. It was very enjoyable, especially for me as someone who defended the idea that it was fine to keep Jeannie last week because really, like, it bore out for me here. We got 100%. to watch Jeannie finally idol. At, first of all, announce, hey, guys, I'm going to go looking for the idol. Like, Even worse. Leading into it, I'm not, I guess that's past tense you know, for us. Uh, uh, she's giving the explanations like, I really need to look for this thing. And then she finds it. And then what you're discussing. Immediately runs back. Guys, guys, I found the idol. <laughs> like, okay, thanks. I mean, you know, you had said last week, like uh, the, the nice thing about having GD around is apparently he's just willing to tell you everything. I guess that was not specific to JD. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. No, as soon as she does that, it's like, oh, so I was wrong. <laughs> like, you know, to, to the point where nobody thinks I'll ever admit that. Like, immediately, like, just flat out wrong. They were right to get rid of JD, or at the very least, there's no difference. And then the preference being, I don't want to have a bonehead around. I totally get it. Because, yes, what they knew that I didn't is Jeannie is just as dumb about this stuff. I uh, just, I, but in more ways, dumber. Like, if JD was around, He's keeping that idol. Like, JD would have an idol at the end of this episode. Whether he... Well, actually, I guess at the end of the episode, he might have handed it over to Shan before the episode ended. <laughs> yeah. But, like, he is taking that B-word, Ben. Yes, exactly. There's there's no hesitation on his part. He would view that as, like, oh, I'm playing Survivor now. And so he'd immediately open it up. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, like, she knows. She knows that she's three of three in this grouping. She So, just that. Like, anybody who's been arguing with me, which has been... You know, kind of fun, but also, you know, also infuriating, which I guess is also kind of fun that um, I've been having arguments about with people today about me admitting that I was wrong last week. Um, like, well, how about not? And the best part is the people arguing with me. Some of them were people telling me I was wrong last week. So there you have it. <laughs> um, <laughs> That they're like, oh, well, Jeannie couldn't do this. Like, sh forget everything else. Forget that there's some risk involved and we'll get into that. She knows that if they go to tribal council, she's getting voted out. So all of this, well, she'll lose her vote. The vote is meaningless. All that Jeannie got to do was pers like get voted out two to one instead of two to nothing. Right. and She knows. And so that was the thing, too, is that even assuming... JD had stuck around. This is one of my points last week is that it didn't necessarily matter which of the two you took out because you wanted to get both of them gone anyway. Um, yep. So assuming JD had stuck around, he did, in theory, have an extra vote. Let's assume Shan gives it back to him. I th had thought that that might then put that alliance in danger of Shan and Ricard. But actually, as Brad pointed out to me, 
ultimately, if it had gone 2-2, Shan or Ricard would have been the only one left that could be a vote. So JD would have gone home here anyway. So really, it's two votes in a row that were just going to go the same way. Just the order was the only thing that was going to change. Yeah, my mistake was not underestimating Jeannie. I had given her too much respect in my analysis. And yet she knows she's at risk. And she's like, nah, pass. Not even not pass. But let me tell the people who will put me at risk that this thing exists. And I will let them decide what to do and listen to their plan. Like, oh, no, we don't want that. That's too tough. That's a big risk. It's like... You're in danger, girl. You need this. No, You could argue nobody else decision-making was as clear as this. We're like five votes in at this point, and there's nobody else to vote for. There's just three people. So being immune is far more valuable than being able to cast a single vote when it is clear that you are third of three. Yep. And, and that's the thing is you can argue like maybe she didn't think she was, but there were so many signs. You know, it's like like relationship red flags. Like you should have sensed some of these red flags. And yeah. And, and I get the sense she did. Yeah. Like I feel like she told us that she was a, like this was not news to her. I think she maybe uh, had some optimism that she could turn Shan. But it was, that's not the same thing as, uh, it's really risky. And then people are like, oh, well, then she'll risk her allies. What allies? She doesn't have allies. <laughs> so you can't risk what you don't have. And they're like, well, if you go into the merge, they are allies. If you go into the merge, you're down numbers. These people aren't going to be your allies. Your new allies are going to be the people that you glom onto. Not these people who will vote and did vote you out so you know also arguing for and they're like uh, the arguments are uh, outcome based yeah it was an incredibly predictable outcome well that's the thing is you have to take into account all the possible outcomes and yes. most of the possible outcomes would lead to her getting voted out the few that wouldn't are the cases where she gets that advantage and it activates and then she uses it or she plays her shot in the dark and it works or they don't go to tribal council, in which case, who cares about your vote? Exactly. But that's, I mean, she has very narrow options that would have worked. And, you know, most of these situations lead to her getting voted out. So, yeah, it's worth the risk in that case. You have so few options that are going to keep you safe. Try one of them. Uh, hilariously, it's like, well, uh, the, uh, the low reward of remaining in the game? That's actually the reward. That's the whole goddamn point, is remaining in the game. And we are at a stage now where you can't plan ahead. You're the next person on the chopping block in a tribe of three. It's survival time, baby. And instead, she, you know, told them about it, and they clowned her. Uh, we'll get that to in a second. But, like, and all the people are like, well, how could she know that it'll activate? You don't. You don't know. I'm sorry that it makes you uncomfortable that there's going to be some factors in this that you need to just take a risk. But that's the game. The game is a risk. Every decision you make will have potential positive and negative outcomes. It's up for you to decide which of those are more negative, more positive, more likely, less likely. And she was the third of three. And if you're like, oh, you don't know somebody else is going to take it. You don't. But in eight times of somebody finding that parcel that says beware seven times people took it the one person who didn't was of course her it's not that bigger i I guess they don't know that of course they're not watching the season but people are going to go for it i think we know that people are going to go for it speaking of shannon ricard how much did you enjoy their reaction to her coming back and telling them that she had found the idol (laughs) Oh, it was so slick. They played it so well. I admire them uh, throughout the episode, and I think that's why this one is my favorite over last week. Um, but I love the how they all they totally snowed her over, and then as soon as she leaves, Shan's like, "Yeah, but I want that idol." <laughs> it's just like, how about, how about right this? How about that's the argument of like, oh, what did she do it or not? The bad player said no, and the good player said yes. And so that like I could just picture in their heads like, well, that was a freebie. <laughs> like she came yeah. back and told them. And showed them where it was. Like, well, shit, that couldn't have worked out better. Um, yeah, and so I had actually thought, like, well, you know, how are they actually going to take this advantage yes. and then somehow not make it obvious that they've done so? And I mean, there weren't a ton of great options to do that. And I thought, you know, for what it was, Ricard's plan was pretty decent. 
I thought it was great. Yeah. I'm right here t- about telling you that it's, not only was I like, well, I was wrong about Genie. I was like, oh, my God. I'm about to be wrong about fake idols. <laughs> <laughs> but then it didn't come to pass and it never will, so I don't have to admit exactly. it. Exactly. But like, yeah, it's like, and then ultimately, if it had come by, it's like, okay, well, in this incredibly unique situation that's never existed before in the history of Survivor, now fake idols come into play where it's like somebody could pass up the shot at it and it's not really an idol just yet and you get to leave it there for them. Yeah, okay, fake idol. Uh, but yeah, no, I thought it was brilliant. I, I thought the way that they planned out how they're going to activate it without Genie being suspicious, like, what a heist. And just hearing the two of them like bounce ideas off each other of how they're going to play it. What's the optimal way to not alert Genie to it. And then how they're going to couch this news to Genie as like, Oh, we're going to feel out if the other people have activated theirs, so then we'll know if you should grab it and blah, blah, blah. I mean, again, not a lot of scenarios that they could have tried <laughs> where it would have made any plausible sense to Genie. But I think that one was about as close as you can come. Yeah, no, they also gamed out, like, okay, well, then what if I lose my uh, vote? Right. And, you know, I guess this is where people are arguing the other side. It's like, well, Shan has that luxury. Um, yeah, but I think they came up with that idea after the idea of, I want that idol. <laughs> yes. Um, because, I, I get, yes, is it understandable that somebody would be so risk adverse as to not do this? Of course. I understand why people lose Survivor. It's not that complicated. What I want people to answer for me is, can you picture a single winner in the past, like, 20 seasons not doing this? Maybe Tommy? But I, I picked 20 seasons because the first 20, they'd be like, what the hell's an idol? You know. Uh, and, frankly, in Heroes vs. Villains, you saw some of those earlier players being like, nah, we don't need to go after idols. Whoever goes after that will vote them out. And Russell is like, yeah, that's nice. I'm going to have it, and then I'm just going to disrupt this game. And he was right. Uh, but, yes. Uh, a weak, bad player but, uh, could very understandably not go after this lifeline that the show is providing them. I think winners would actually be like, it's time to win. And, you know, I hope that's actually what happened. No, it was just, just such a treat. I, I love seeing that sort of thing. Like two people, you know, uh, coming together, analyzing a situation. You know, sometimes one person, they can do it for us. But just thinking through all this stuff. And we should note that they're doing it in real time uh, on apparently one of the hottest days of the year. Where they haven't had much food. Again, this team hasn't had Flint for a while. Right. And they're not confused. Apparently, these the most confusing advantages ever. They figured out uh, every single like way to beat this thing. I mean, to me, obviously, you did a Cook Islands rewatch recently enough. It, it struck me as like the Yule and Pennert conversation where they're just gaming out. Like, okay, here's what's going to happen. And I love shit like that. Like, that was... No, it, it's Fiji, them trying to figure that out. It's Palau with Tom and Ian. Yeah, no, this is what I eat on. This is what I live for. Right. And it was amazing to watch like i'm just sitting there and i'm watching and you know i'm as aroused as a furry looking at a tony the tiger cereal box yeah it's interesting you say that because what i was thinking when i was watching it is that the word bed looks like a bed hey guys Mm -hmm. hi yeah it's it's me mike hirsch uh music theme guy hello what's up man yeah, uh, good to be here. Um, I just, I wanted to add to the perfectly normal things that both of you just said and say that I truly believe that trigonometry is just dead relatives saying something racist at Thanksgiving. Okay, great. Uh, have a good podcast, guys. Um, Hirsch out. <laughs> All right. How do I turn this off? You just hit that, hit that button there. Yeah. Oh, oh, we got it. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, everyone knows that about the trigonometry thing. So that was pretty Absolutely. obvious. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's common knowledge. I think everything that is said here makes complete sense and also fills me with a sense of like accomplishment. Like, I just, I feel like um, people can't get me now. I'm kind of. Um, I would say like bulletproof, it would be the adjective I would use. That, that was, the, I, I was struggling for the word. It was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Just like, you might try, but. Yeah, they're just going to bounce off of me. So, yeah, no, it's a good feeling and a good point. It's almost like, you know, when you get the um, the vaccine where you get some level of, like, uh, immunity. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And you know what else was like that? Hmm. Um, in this episode, there were, there were immunity idols. Literal, like, not uh, idols were activated. And my God, was that beautiful. It was a beautiful scene. You know, I think I'd, I don't remember if it was last week or the week before, I'd complained that they'd used the nonlinear editing thing a little weakly. Like it wouldn't, it wasn't the best possible use. This right here 
was the absolute perfect use. Beautiful head fake, like an ankle breaker of an edit. Just perfect. Like I was like, oh, shit, you got me. And I have, I've watched 41 seasons of this show. And even I thought that there was not going to be someone else to speak up. Which is well done. Yeah, I was so bummed when it went to commercial. I was like, oh, those idiots still haven't found it. Um, and yeah, no, and like, so that was, but even leading up, like, you know, to continue our thought about Shannon Ricard, they set that up so beautifully, uh, the way that they introduced both the, their phrase and then practically, you know, pointed over like they were setting up Xander yep. and then like, oh, it like, again, I just admire Ricard and Shan so much. And, and uh, that one, it felt even more Ricard. He was doing a lot of the, the, the set, you know, the setup. She, she was the closer, apparently. Um, and then, and then they got us, and I was just like, oh, oh fuck, yes. Yes, and, and Nasir being the one to deliver it was beautiful. And then the flashback scene, get the sepia tones, and we see him digging through the trees and talking about his daughters and this cute little story about how they hid stuff in the backyard for him. Adorable. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Are you suggesting that this uh, advantage, uh, you know, situation and description mm-hmm. was filled with personal content that would let us really get to know the the the, the character. Some more. I would never suggest such a thing because I am of the belief that advantages are ruining this show. I loved his excitement over it. That is like this is why I love this game. Um, and then yeah, no, the the talk about his daughter is just amazing. Just furthering why this year is great. Uh, one note though is like clearly his daughter wasn't hiding them very difficultly because it <laughs> took like ten days to find it. Everybody else is finding it without all that practice this year. Yeah, she really needed to um step up her game and make her dad practice a little harder than that. I think. But no, oh, man, that was a fantastic scene. And to further, I guess our thesis for this week made possible by the new things that Survivor was doing. Okay, we don't know the end result. It could, it could mess things up down the line. But it hasn't yet, so how about we shut the fuck up about it and enjoy what's happening? Well, I enjoyed very much that Nasir spoke up and then there was that brief pause because it was so beautiful that it seemed like Probst was wrapping it up and we're about to start the challenge. And then it's just the the cutting, the editing. Yeah. A plus, chef's kiss. Fantastic. And then after, because I watched it again today, uh, after, uh, you know, the the... The flashback to him getting it and why it's so great. Uh, it also cuts to him just like, you know, letting loose just this awesome laugh, which would could totally be out of context. But this sense of relief, like, yes, I did it. It's happening. So, oh, no. It was, it, oh, I loved it. Like, you know, people are complaining. And is it hokey that they're saying these phrases 100%? Yep. Maybe it's messing. But that was just an amazing moment. Uh, it just co- coalesced perfectly. And I'm glad that Xander was around to, to complete his mission, <laughs> even if by the end of the episode, it might look like you, Lucy was going to pull that football away. We'll get to that uh, later. But yeah, that he you know, was like, oh, my God, I, they, they set me out to say it again. I've been dreading each and every time when I have to say it one more time. So, so far on balance. I think the whole, you know, beware and having to say the phrase and all that has added a fun element to this season. Thus far. Yeah, I don't know that it would necessarily do so in a future season. Like maybe 42 because they haven't seen it, but that's... Exactly. It. So that would be the time that it could work. Um, the thing, I, and I, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I, I also rewatched the uh, the scene. And it really did seem like he was... Like this look of relief washed over his face yes, after he, he said the AstroTurf thing. He's <laughs> like... Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> and then there's this beaming smile. And then it cuts to Xander, who's like, oh, thank fucking God. <laughs> Finally. And there's a cut to Liana be looking like, like she's pissed because yep, like, she knows, right? And we got that early, se- uh, early scene. Uh, Tiffany and Liana digging through the bag. And getting the confirmation, uh, which delightfully led Tiffany to be like, this guy's got to go, which two things. One. Yeah, duh. I mean, what did you think was going to be the next person voted out? This is not new information. But two, it's like, this is what we were trying to get you to do and you wouldn't let us do like eight days ago, Tiffany. And, you know, to be fair to her, that's why she wanted a little more evidence. Yep. Oh, no, no. It was just, I I loved it. And I think stuff like this, again, we don't know. It could go bad. Um, I'm a fool who chooses to wait 
until things actually do go bad before I talk about it. Maybe it's because I talk about it every week and why spoil future content. But it's like, I, I feel like this has been a nice little evolution because as much as people want to talk about, you know, the advantages, not a single one has been in play yet through five episodes, you know, possibly an entire pre merge type thing. We don't know. There wasn't an active idol in the game until tonight, you know, like that's actually pretty rare. So if we're kind of balancing it, it's possible that the the restrictions that they placed on these things might have led to some balance or maybe they just got lucky. I don't yeah, know. Who knows what would happen with a different cast. Um, but you did mention Leanna after that challenge, Leanna's picked to go off on the hike up that mountain. Well, Shanna's picked and Leanna picks herself, but yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so Leanna and, Shan go up there and for me as a Shan fan I'm excited because I think I've mentioned before like I'm very excited to see how well Shan's magic works outside of the tribe that she's in you know I I don't tend to think that it's somehow specific to the group that she's with I think she's just that socially gifted that it's going to work on others as well so it was nice for me to finally see whether that bore itself out and I think it very much did I was shocked to learn she was, like, nearing mid-30s. I was like, really? It's just like Liana was, I guess, yeah. Uh, not to say that she comes off immature. Just, you know, I, I thought she was a little younger than that. Yeah, no, it was great. And, again, um, as much as people want to complain about the all the reward, all the advantages, I feel like every single one of the advantage distribution scenes, like at that second island, has been a good scene. I feel like they've all done really good c- character work. Probably the lesser one was the one at night yeah. Uh, because there was a clock on it. But even there, you got to get a sense of Tiffany. You got to get a sense of Sydney. Um, that was also probably the worst one because we had to go through each one of them, like having, like finding the Beware Idol and all right. that. Um, and that was the worst episode of the season. But like, yeah, I, okay, advantage, advantage. And we're going to get into this specific advantage. But we really got to know Shan in this moment and we got to have this really interesting new element between Liana and Shan, which was the exact sort of thing that we wanted when we were arguing that they need to diversify the cast more. Yeah. And I think also, you know, we've mentioned this before, but that block is always going to be filled with something, right? It'll be a reward challenge. It'll be like Island of the Idols, Edge of Extinction, whatever. It's something along those lines. And given those options, I think you're right. I think every time they've gone here, I've enjoyed it. I've liked seeing these people interact with the people on the other tribes of like learning a little bit more about them. And in this one in particular, man, I mean, the Shan scene was great. Everything that she and Leanna said, the way they connected over like two, three hours, whatever they said it was awesome. Um, The one hesitation I had, again, this is more as a fan of Shan's game than anything else is like, oh man, she really does seem to connect with people on a level, which I I do worry is going to make them feel super betrayed by her when she cuts them. Um, because, you know, she did seem to have a pretty deep emotional connection in a very short time frame with Leanna. And if that's her game, oh, it could be risky. But man, I'm I'm just so impressed by her. Yeah. And I will say that uh, a couple things, the show is evolving to the point where, People might be less uh, touchy about those things. It's hard to say because we get so few women in front of a jury to really understand that. Um, And those have been the ones that have been traditionally punished. There have been a few men that have been punished for said behavior as well. Coach being one that really jumps to the top of mind. Um, And then another is it seems like the people she's voted out so far and she's gotten some reps at doing it. Um, and we'll get into that. Uh, the reps that she got in this episode might help her a bit, uh, manage this sort of thing going forward. So that's good. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I like the scene. I like getting the behind the scenes looks. And I think why these scenes have also worked is that the show has been adaptive to how they edit them. So when like the prisoner's dilemma part is like a really interesting decision, they give us more of it. This time, it, it really isn't the same thing with the uh, Evie and Deshaun one. It really wasn't. They were just like, hey, there's two of us. I'm not doing it. Take it. Um, so instead, they mix in more of the personal content and going, you know, even, um, you know, with photos and, you know, whatever footage they have of off-island life. And I think, like, 
the editors have been really on their game. And maybe that's the biggest advantage they've had for having a year off of not having to like prep a show like, you know, twice in a year, that many episodes that quick. Cause you know, I don't know if people know this, they go through a lot of footage. Uh, <laughs> they need to pile it through and they don't have a lot of time. Um, I know people have in their imagination that they like, they don't start airing an episode until the entire thing is cut and, you know, 15 people. No, it's sometimes it's like, Oh, it's Friday and I want to go home. Uh, throw in the, the obvious scene that, you know, is just a nice placeholder. And then, you know, the fun thing we get to do is analyze that scene of what the explicit type of edit they got, you know, not just like the, 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 the basics of winners edit or whatever. No, this is the yada, yada, yada edit. My favorite is like when somebody likes to say like some obscure former survivor, there's a specialized edit. Oh yeah. The Natalie white edit that everyone's yeah, gunning for. It. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, when, when, when does it, they create new edits, you know, because, you know, if, if these are standard edits, wouldn't they all be like from the first few seasons or so? And every once in a while, a huge architect type broke through. It's kind of like the idea of like reincarnation. It's like there's 7 billion people now. Where are all these new souls? Why are we now getting new edits? Aren't these all just like uh, variations of the tie edit from, you know, however many years you're, ago? I don't you're know. getting really deep here. Um, I, but hey, while we're beating dead horses though, I'm going to, I'm going to go back and beat one of my own personal favorite ones. Beat your own, John. Beat it good. <laughs> I've been told I'm quite good at doing that. <laughs> anyway. Um, we watched Shan just masterfully interact with all these other people. And this, to be clear, is the quote unquote social game that people like to attribute to so many people that have never actually demonstrated it. You know, we like to say like, oh, off scene, I'm sure this person was super charming. A certain winner of Ko Rong was, you know, the most charming. Oh, she's got the social game for days. Chrissy from heroes hustlers healers. healers you got me thanks boo um yeah it, exactly chrissy like formulaically said like oh i know about your cousin or some shit like that's not social game that's trivia like what the fuck you don't know anything about me shan within not even a day of knowing this person just formed a bond like that's a fucking social game. I can't do that shit. I can't go randomly talk to a stranger and be like, man, I, I think that person and I really connected. That never happens to me. And I, I get the sense that Shan is so good, she can just do that all the time. Like, that is a skill that she has that others just don't. So, we've been doing this for seven years now. Who do you think has had uh, more personal content shared between them? You and I... Or Shannon Liana in that four hours. Absolutely. It's probably close, right? It, it's extremely close to the point that your wife will have to prod you about things that you can ask me and vice versa. My wife will say, ask questions about you. And I'll be like, I don't, why would I know these things about Andy? I just podcast with him. It's like, yeah, every time we're done, she's like, so how's John? I'm like, I don't know. He talks to, responds to my talking. Uh, he still has opinions about the show that are, you know, Almost, but not quite as good as mine. I, he's, he didn't cry while we were podcasting. What do you he, want from he's me? He's going to edit the podcast? Is that what you wanted to know? <laughs> he seems well fit enough to do it. Um, yeah, no. And I, I, what I also liked about them is just this continues. This the, What we've seen so far is that you just take two people and put them on an island. Suddenly they're co-conspirators and like the whole sense of like, I got to keep things secret. Just that spills out. Let's tell them what they knew. How could it ever you know, factor? I don't even sleep near them. It's, it's really interesting. That dynamic, obviously there are other dynamics at play in this specific pairing, but we've seen it each time where they're just like, Oh yeah, no, this is what's going on. This is what we're working together right now. Aren't we? And it's like, no, not, no. Oh. I think they have genuine plans to do so uh, in the future. But yeah, each time it was just like, yeah, th 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 we, we squad, right? Because we're here and in four hours we won't be. Well, and it and it's very funny, too, that like each time that they've come out, that has happened it, with the exception of the Brad, Tiffany and Sydney combo, which did not. However, well, even there, apparently they were both like, you know, yeah, Brad, get it, get it. Because he was like, I'm in trouble. But yes, clearly Sydney and Tiffany, less so yeah, much. not so much vibing. I mean, the very first time they went out, it's a bunch of bros just broing out. You know, JD's talking about his track medals <laughs> and Xander and Danny are just, you know, broing out. Listening. Yeah, as one does when JD is talking. But Evie 
and Deshaun, again, talking just like they're going to be idols. Like, oh, we're going to hit the merge. We're going to hit swaps, whatever. We're going to work together. It's going to be great. This one, however, I think is different because I think, you know, Shan, I, th- I don't remember if it was Shan or Leanna had mentioned that they kind of had their eye on the other for a while and like wanted to meet. And so I genuinely think like they'd kind of been making eyes at each other and like, yeah, you seem like the type of person I'd want to work with. There's that initial com- conversation. They hit on a level where they're like, yeah, you know what? This can work out long term. And so just spills it all out. Everything's coming out. Like, yeah, we're going to work together because <laughs> here's what I know. Here's my situation. Tell me about yours. And it works. I think it was an awesome scene. So as a result of that, Liana gets a brand new advantage to the game. Uh, the knowledge is power advantage. And, you know, as much as we've been like saying people cool it on the, the complaints about advantages in general i do think there is room for debate about the efficacy of certain ones the potential you know risks or whatever uh so what were your what were or are your current thoughts of uh that that advantage yeah i as i was watching i was like what and then <laughs> i'm looking at twitter too and immediately fishback tweets out like i hate this and you know you and i are generally the types that will reserve judgment but in this case I, my snap judgment was like, oh, shit, this is not good. And I think the thing that really bothers me is just the the mandating that someone has to tell you the truth. Like, you know how us Americans hate mandates. But um, just the idea that Probst has said for so long, like, oh, you know, if you can be smooth and like he holds up Boston Rob as this amazing survivor player. Part of that being because Rob could be smooth and lie to your face now you're taking one of those important skills, quote unquote, away from somebody. Like you basically put a lie detector in front of them and say, no, 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 you can't lie. You have to admit to this. I, I don't love that as a game mechanic. Right. But if you're allowing them to steal something, they can't lie about it. Otherwise, why would you ever say yes? You know, why would you ever like give it away? You'd be like, I don't have an idol. Like, oh, OK, well, that was a waste. So of the, the other way you would do it, would you be have to tell them? hey, if someone's going to play an idol, then you can steal it. However, this is steal an advantage. So if they're going to play a double vote, would you necessarily know so that you could steal it? I guess not. I mean, who knows? Right. And I think another reaction besides the the aversion to, uh, you know, forcing people in a game of lying to tell the truth, which I understand that reaction, especially because it's not clear from the scene, like, where and how that takes place. Liana does at one, like near the end after she's read it, been like, when I'll have to do this at council or she doesn't say like she has to, but like when I do this at tribal council. So at me, I was like, Oh, okay. So that's where you do it. And then thus it makes a lot more sense. Yes. Um, whereas, yeah, you're just walking them up, walking up to them in the, you know, the watering hole and be like, Hey, you got to tell me the truth like that, 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 that doesn't work. Um, is that it's, it's uh, like a lot of people were just viewing it. As like a newfangled idol nullifier, um, mm. and I don't really like the idol nullifier. It's been done twice: uh, once uh, in favor of people I was cheering for, once very much not. Uh, once basically uh, dousing the only potential ray of sunlight in a really dark season. Um, but neither time I really liked it. You know, uh, it's, I, I liked the result when uh, Hot Cop Dan went home and the plucky underdogs. Uh, move forward but even the time like man that's a bunch of bullshit for Dan. like he did nothing wrong uh like either these things are that or they're not um so if it becomes that and that is a very likely scenario for it then it's just like yeah i mean it's a little different you gotta uh do it before the votes are cast you gotta do it publicly as opposed to just dropping it in the bag but you know having one shot and calling people that was the same for the nullifier you had to play it to nullify a specific person's item right um, so if it's just used that, that like, Hey, we want to vote out this person. We know they have an idol. Then that that's boring. It's, uh, it's eliminating a potential twi- uh, like, you know, uh, exciting moment, uh, and making it less exciting, but it's, it's not just a nullifier. It's a steal, right. which opens up a lot of potentially interesting angles. Like for instance, Liana could save herself with it. Say she is the target of the vote heading into tribal council. Uh, you know, it's obvious, or at least she feels enough like it. She could stand up and be like, I'm going to steal Nasir's idol. And now chaos. 
Okay, for one, she's not going home. In fact, she might not even have to play that idol she just stole because everybody now is alive tribal. Like, oh, we were going to vote for her and they need to find a new target. That would be an exciting way that this could be. Somebody uh, we could use it to you know help themselves get out from you know, the bottom of the scenario. Um, and then like an even crazier one. This is like way out there and it's weird that it's coming for me. Uh, what if it was one of those scenarios that people just love so much? And honestly, they should. It's fun. That um, somebody makes a fake idol <laughs> and then they hide it for somebody else to find. And then that person gets so excited they got this idol and they almost make it they make it obvious. Maybe they even tell the holder of this uh, you know, steel uh, thing. And then they're like, and so then it's tribal council and the holder of that is like, Hey, buddy, do you have an idol? They're not lying. They think they do. And they steal a fake idol and then get voted out with the fake idol that they stole. That would be amazing. Oh, and here is once again where fake idols fall short. Because I I think if you asked, do you have an idol? The truth would be no. (laughs) So... But their truth would be yes. Like, they're not lying to you. They just don't know. Sure. We're going to go with their truth here. (laughs) They're not, but it, according to them, they'd be like, yes, they'd be pissed off. They think they're idle. You know, again, that, is that the show has to, you know, validate this thing or show just has to make sure you're not lying because you're not lying if you have your fake idol stolen because you think you have Oh, see, idol. and it, I'm thinking. I'm, not, I'm saying if you're the person who made a fake idol, you can't lie about it. But if you're a person who found a fake idol and you think it's the real idol. You're telling the truth when you hand that thing over because you think it's a real idol. I was thinking of it more as like a heroes versus villain situation where Russell would be like, all right, Rupert, I want your idol. And Rupert pulls out a rock and it's like, cool, bro. <laughs> Here's my rock. Yeah, no, no, that, not that scenario. I'm saying like, um, like, uh, who's the, who found fake idols? Like, uh, Jason, <laughs> Jason has this fucking stick and he thinks it's an idol and somebody like, you know, and everybody knew that Jason, or at least some people thought Jason had one and then they steal it from Jason and he'd be like, here you go. And they'd be like, what is this? It's a fucking <laughs> stick. He's like, what? It has a face. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody who has already been fooled with a fake idol and then has it stolen. That'd be amazing. Oh, clowned a second time by the same fake idol. Wow. Oh. That okay. I don't know how Micronesia could have gotten better, but that that's the answer. It could have been so much better. Yeah. So I understand um, the concern over these things because my biggest one is that, like the null, like it was just a way of making the nullifier more interesting. And I guess it's probably what it is. And ultimately, it might be because it's more than a nullifier. It's a steal, and then also it. Uh, uh, there's more strategic possibilities because it also applies to advantages. And while idols are generally more empower- more powerful than advantages, there are situations where they're not. There are situations where you yourself aren't the target of the vote. So the idol isn't really necessarily going to help you, but your alliance needs one more vote. So then maybe it would make more sense for Liana to steal Deshaun's extra vote than it would to steal, you know, Xander's idol or whoever. Right. right? right. So in that situation, say it's 6-6, six, six, you can't – I mean, you could steal the idol and then hope that you play it on the right person. The more advantageous thing would be to just get an extra vote so that you can, like, win 7-6. to six. Yeah. Or in this scenario, it could be like eight to six or nine to six because of all the other ones. Um, and then what was the other concern people had about it? Uh, oh, the way you had raised it. Yeah, yeah, and I did. I said that, you know, it's it's difficult because there's so many people basically yelling out, I have an idol at those immunity challenges. And I, how many people could even conceivably not know about the idol savings right now? Like, again, this is not typical for a normal season. But in this specific season, the maximum number of people that – don't know about the idol sayings thing and thus don't know where the idols are is four Dan- Danny, Erica, Heather, and Sydney. Those are the only people who might not know. And we don't even know for sure that they don't know. Yeah, we don't. We just, we have no confirmation that right. they do. And I mean, I suppose we know Deshaun knows that there are weird sayings. He doesn't necessarily know the weird sayings. Um, like, so he's like, a. I suppose it's possible he doesn't know, but I'm pretty confident he does, right? Um, he, he he does not seem like a dull guy. Like, I think he's kind of figured things out. Agreed. Agreed. I'm just saying, like, confirmed we know that, like, you know, seven other people know. About right. This. Um, yeah. From there, it's like, that's 
not necessarily a design of the game problem. It's like these people need to keep their fucking mouth shut. Like, shout out to Nasir, who proved that it's actually possible just not to tell people. Amazing. <laughs> who knew? Amazing. And I, I like both this and the Beware Advantage. I wonder if the producers are like, well, shit, man. This doesn't work if they just tell everybody. You know, so that people before they even find the Beware Advantage know what the risk is. They're not supposed to know until they open it. And yeah, the whole, you know, activating thing. Uh, yeah, the three people involved were supposed to know. I wanted to see, hey, it would also be fun if people like start to be like, hey, what's all this about? But people like, it's obvious when somebody says that. It is not <laughs> obvious that when somebody says something weird, they'd be like, oh, well, that must be a three-part idol that can only be activated by phrases. And until then, it's not an idol. And in fact, they don't get a vote. That is not obvious because it's an insane thing that we've been making fun of. It's clear that something's up. But you don't have no idea what it would if people didn't tell everybody. Right. right. And that's the thing is if Deshaun did. So Deshaun comes back with that meeting with Evie. And if he, if I'm on his tribe and he tells me that, then I'd be like, oh, shit. Okay. That makes sense. I would have never reached that conclusion on my own, though. I'd be like, what the hell? There's clearly something going on. But there is no way that my immediate jump goes to, oh, yeah, it's three, three idols. That's what's happening. Frankly, even being told, Tiffany didn't truly believe it until she read it with her own eyes. So. Exactly. <laughs> Good point. So, yeah, it's like, so it, that is what makes it feel even worse. But it's like, that's actually just an unfortunate circumstance that maybe they should have seen through. And there is something about these that seems to encourage sharing. And clearly they want to encourage some level of sharing between the three people. The, you know, the Eiffel Tower of Idols, as one of our commenters put it up. Um, but... It's not necessarily inherent in it. It is, you know, theoretically possible if they were to do this again. And again, I think they also can never do this in a season after people have seen it in play. Uh, future players would just shut up about it and not tell people, especially, you know, after seeing what happens to Brad and JD and, you know, Jeannie and everybody else. Uh, almost Sander, but not quite. Um, yeah, so from there, it's like that's, that's an unfortunate part of the design. But I, don't, I in general, I think... That there could be something to this knowledge is power. Yeah, and I think you've you've convinced me not to necessarily embrace it, but to at least go back to my typical "I'll wait and see how it plays out" thing because I think there are some yeah. clear potential downsides to it. But I did like this the possibilities that you raised that it could be used in very fun and innovative ways. And one just thing I'll put out there for other people is just like to ask yourself honestly: if when you heard about this twist or any new twist, especially the ones this season. If you immediately thought about how it could go wrong every time, that might say something about you, you know? It's like, yeah, did you even ever be like, oh, this could be fun? Or if you just immediately, oh, they've ruined it again. Then it's just like, well, again, you have your own preferences. You're allowed to wish that Survivor was less like this and more like it was before. I would know it would say it's, it's never going back. Okay. Like this was the one hope this season after a time off and 40, this is what survivor is now. And you know, I still like it. So there's that. Um, so we get through all of the advantage and she gets back from, you know, her hike. And now it's time to re meet her, you know, two uh, tribe mates. Interestingly, neither of them, even for a second, really believed that they were convincing the other one to vote for Shan. The power she holds. Neither of them were entertaining it for a moment. No, and that's the thing is uh, they even gave us scenes of, you know, Jeannie talking to the camera being like, oh, you know, maybe I convinced Ricard and vice versa. It's like, no, come on. Neither of you believe that because both of you look to Shan and like, well, you're the swing vote to the point that probes that tribal is like, so Shan, you're the swing vote. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this leads to the Shan versus Ricard, and for possibly the third time uh, this episode, I'm going to say that was my favorite scene of this episode. <laughs> I think this this one might be it for me, and I think it's yeah. just because I love these two working together, and I think that you know both of them were doing perfectly logical things for their own game. You know, earlier in the episode, Shan had given Ricard the extra vote because she's like, okay, well, if I'm going to risk my vote, then I can't even use the vote, so you're going to need it, and they're doing all the right things. And there's just this conversation where Shan asks for the extra vote back. And he's like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. I'm not an idiot. And there was just this game recognized game vibe where I could almost tell like Shan would have lost respect for him if he gave that extra vote. Right. Yeah. 
I was really impressed with Ricard in that scenario, but mostly just fascinated at the cat and mouse game between them. It's like, oh man, this is great because they are, I they are like a pairing. They are an yes. alliance. There is some level of survivor trust there, and yeah, you know, just prior to this, Shan defines how trust works in Survivor and that you can't trust anybody, but you have to trust somebody. And we see the limits of that because they both know that each of them is a serious player and thus not somebody to be trusted. Uh, and it's just fascinating. It's like the, uh, when you make Alliance partners, it, it's probably really great to have an equal that you can bounce stuff off of. We saw how it worked to really elite levels earlier this episode. But it's also like maybe this is why you need a complementary alliance partner instead of somebody who's too much like you <laughs> because they both were just like yeah what are we doing here and uh, you yeah. know and what I also liked is Ricard showed it's like Shan you've been playing in the minor leagues you know that shit you got away with last week with JD is not gonna fly with me and possibly many other players in this game and I like that she got that heat check earlier where she's like. I get everything I asked for. I told Jeannie not to play an idol, and then I grabbed it. Why not ask this thing? And Ricard was just like, no. Right. <laughs> I, you, I was here two days ago. I told you what to do to do this very thing to somebody you voted out. No. Why, you play your idol then. I love that. And she was like, that's ridiculous. Why would I? Yeah, exactly. That's ridiculous. Yes. Why would and I? Like I love that they have the type of alliance where they call each other on their own shit. Like, no, 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 no. Are you kidding? I wouldn't play the idol. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't do that because that'd be stupid. And I would be stupid to give you back the extra vote. And just like them bouncing these things back and forth off each other. I was like, oh, God, please don't ever break this up. I, I love – I actually – I want to see how they work independently. But also, I love their dynamic so much. They're like, for me – it's like a new JD and Fishback situation. Like it's just they clearly need to be a unit in order to be the most successful. And yet I I don't know that they'll stay that way. Yeah. And I mean, they are complementary in some yeah. ways. I think there are uh, defined strengths within both of them. But I also do think that they're both a little too similar. You know, they're both here to play, man. They're both here to be you know, prepared to cut throats when necessary. And they, in that scene, it was just so clear. And... I know it made a lot of people uncomfortable, people rooting for Shan, of which uh, I am wholeheartedly a part of that group. Um, but then they're like, oh, man, this is a misstep. And in some ways it was a misstep, right? Like his whole point, like, no, why are you even like she leads off with the, you know, the old uh, I don't oh, this is going to feel bad. I don't want to put you upset. It's like whenever you say I don't want to upset you, you're about to say some upsetting yep. shit. Um, and, but for me, it's like you're gonna have to learn how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable if you're a Shan fan this season. And it's not because she's bad at Survivor. It's because she's playing proactively. She's playing aggressively. And she takes big risks. Yeah. She's here to win and she's playing for it. She's going for things. And sometimes that will mean assuming a lot of risk. And could that mean that she will not win? Sure. Most people don't. <laughs> but... There have been many winners that have been willing to play on that edge. And it's just like, yeah, it might not be your comfort zone. Uh, she is attracting the sort of fans, uh, like across the aisle, you know, you know, people that like the, the big swings and people that, you know, don't, you just have to get used to it. And where I'm at, cause obviously I criticized her move last week and I was wrong. Um, I'm probably not going to criticize a lot of future moves from her for the next little while. Not because I'm like, you know, in the can. But because at this point she's demonstrated a level of, I have to believe that she knows what she's doing and that even if a move is suboptimal, she has the game to cover for it next. You know, and you know, we got there in Kageon very early. It's like, yeah, no, other people doing this stuff wouldn't be you know, very good. But this specific player doing this stuff, we have to trust that they know what they're doing or that they can overcome the various things because... And ugh. that was my point last week. It's like, I, I feel like Shan is the type that can make strategic mistakes and recover. But because she's partnered with Ricard, I think he actually had a pretty good assessment of their... I mean, it, again, it's surface level assessment. Who knows? It's only based on what we've seen. But it seemed correct. And where he said, you know, like, I come up with a devious plan. Shan has the, like basically the ability to execute those plans. And it, 
it seems like that's their dynamic. Like, I don't think he has the same social skill as she does. So if he's off on his own, I don't think everyone's going to embrace him in the way that they'll embrace Shan. I think Shan would suffer without him being a strategic partner for her. But I think of those two skill sets, hers is more valuable because you can get by without the social game or without the strategy if you have a super strong social. Well, game. and also I would say I don't think she's without strategy. I just think she doesn't. Exactly. That's the thing is she's not weak and strategically. It's just that she's she needs that partner, I think, to bounce those ideas off. And I would it's from what little we've seen, I would maybe give him a slight savviness edge. But I mean, again, it's a fairly equal partnership. Yeah. Uh, and again, a part of it is also edit, but he definitely does seem to like really have the temperature of what's going on. He sees through people, including her, uh, very easily. Like I really admire his mind for this, but I don't think he's got the juice to win. Um, and it's just I, what connections has he made? You know, I think people, frankly, see it on him that like, and he that's is the more, problem. I think he just comes across as the person who is playing you. Shan will play you. But doesn't come across that way. Yeah. So, you know, he's more of a, you know, consigliere than the Godfather. Um, and yeah, like, I, I might listen to his exit, like, podcasts. Probably not. I don't listen to those anymore. <laughs> I listen to, like, one Survivor podcast, and it's the one where I'm talking most of the time. Um, but, like, I, I'll read it. Because, like, yeah, he really seems to, like, have really good thoughts and understanding of what's going on. But... Yeah, she's the one. Uh, if somebody else is out there doing the closing, well, that's what's important. Always be closing. You know? And, you know, even him, like, kind of bringing about, like, complaining about it, tribal councils, like, okay, you know, <laughs> then do some of that stuff yourself, man. And the good news is, as Brope's kind of pointed out, you got time. Nobody uh, who's gone, nobody who has seen this dynamic thus far uh, will decide these sort of things. Although I did like when he was like, or maybe? <laughs> Uh, that's fine. I love it when he fucks with their expectations, even if their expectations are correct. Um, uh, yeah, it's, but so far, yeah, the person who actually does the thing is the one that gets credit for it. I'm sorry for everybody who feels that that's unfortunate. <laughs> if you want to fly under the radar, you might have to deal with the fact that you never came in on the radar. And now, I don't think he is. I think people are fully aware of his capabilities and um, the way he presents it, at least all the people that are gone so far. It's just, I I think a lot of them would have loved to have voted him out. It's just, they didn't want to cross Shannon. Exactly. And I think that's the type of thing that I was talking about earlier, where he's going to need her more than she's going to need him. And I think his path to victory is likely going to be, have her around with him as long as possible, and then be the one that takes her out and hope that she becomes your cheerleader. Yeah. And as much as it's exciting to see them work together, I hope it's also exciting that they can last and then turn on each other like that, you know, because we saw this episode, it was thrilling to see them work together. And then it was thrilling to see that little confrontation and like, you know, bouncing off of each other. Uh, I don't think it's as damaging as some people were worried about. I'm thinking they both left that conversation in good terms. Oh, yeah. And obviously, you know, we got the vote that helped confirm it. I don't think there's going to be bitterness uh, as much as, you know, there might be a raised eyebrow. I think they're both well aware of what the the score is between the two of them. So I don't know if either of them really learned anything new in that interaction. It's like, oh, well, my partner is actually devious and wants to, is playing for their own self-interest. I think they're aware. Right. I think that was part of what I enjoyed about that conversation so much is that it really was a meeting of equals. It was not like I – there was some, you know, cat and mouse trying to feel the other person out. But I, I don't think there was any lack of respect there. It was very much like, a, okay, well played, fine, and then walked away. And then back to the alliance. So, Shan did have the decision here to vote it out. Sure. Was Jeannie the right call? Oh, I don't know, man. It's a tough call. I think this was – the most clear-cut decision, possibly, yeah. of the season so far. I know people are like, oh, Ricard is threatening. It's like, eh, I mean, yes, but also no. You know, it's like, and not because I don't, again, not because of what I said about him being less likely to win than she. Uh, it's that he's helpful to her. You can't vote out everybody who's good at Survivor if you also want to be good at Survivor. Uh, yeah, no, their partnership is good. Move it forward. This is easy. No brainer. Move it on. And, yeah. yeah. And again, I think it's... a sort of in that sense, a J.D. Fishback dynamic where it's like, no, if 
if JD votes out Fishback, yeah, maybe he still succeeds. If Fishback somehow survives and JD getting voted out, that guy's screwed. <laughs> I think it's similar here. Like, Shan can absolutely, as the JD of this scenario, keep Ricard around for as long as she needs. Yeah, and if they are going to navigate the tough waters they had to add from, uh, I think it's going to require the the joint powers Agreed. of the two of them. Because um, I don't like the chances for both of them. I'm not ruling out one of them being the winner, but, you know, for the whole Matt Singh thing that we let off discussing, um, I think, again, Ricard aptly pointed this out. People are going to be looking for it. Um, so... I mean, we already know one tribe was talking about it. Like, the people he saw are aware that this is a, a phenomenon, a thing. So, much like, you know, nobody lets two uh, people of the opposite sex, you know, mildly flirt without having to, I mean, let's vote, out honest, the woman. vote out the woman. <laughs> um, I don't know if people are going to let a Denise and Malcolm get to the end. But, yeah, if it's these two, I'd be interested. Yeah, that's the problem is you almost have to innovate every time because people at least – you know, the types of Survivor fans that they're casting now are looking for these sorts of things. So you have to do something that's maybe not innovative, but at the very least is not going to be front of mind as a strategy that they think it's going to be employed. Yeah. And that's the way the show is going to be from now on. I don't think they're ever going back to a period where they shun fans of the show. I don't I don't think that audience and that casting pool exists yeah. anymore. Or should they try I think- to shun such a thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy bringing in some of them. Uh, some of them are delightful. Yes, that's great. true. Um, we love you, Ken. You're the best. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I think the show is very comfortable with the fact that like we have our, you know, uh, self-replicating and renewing niche audience and good things can come from it. But of course, that's also why they need to innovate is that you know, if you cast so many people who know the playbook, you need to, you know, throw in wrinkles so that they can't just, you know, script out their place. So yeah, no, Genie was the right decision all, all along. Uh, no questions for me either. Uh, anything else? No, let's tell people where they can find us. Uh, our website is purplerockpodcast.com where you can argue with me in credit, uh, comments. Uh, Any time you want to uh, say that I was not wrong about something, bring it. I- I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, you can, of course, find us on Twitter. The show is at Purple Rock Pod. I'm at Purple Rock John. And Andy is, of course, at Purple Rock Andy. We're so good at the branding around here. Yeah, uh, purple and a four letter name. If, not, if you've got five letters in a name, you got to find a way to drop one. Um, <laughs> Drop one. <laughs> nice. Anything else? No, let's hit some theme music.